So when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. So good. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Amen. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are dangerous, trapped to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Amen. When Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? This is God's word. Amen. Why don't we open in prayer? Father, uh, we thank you that you invite us to be still and know that you are God. To be still. You invite us, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Lord, we need rest. And we find our rest in you. So as we come to you to receive all that you have for us, we need to let go of those things that we're clinging to. So Lord, would you help us to pry our fingers off of those things that we hold so dear, and would you give us the grace to release those things so that we could have empty hands before you to receive all that you have. So come, Lord Jesus, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin with a story, um, stories about John Muir. Around 1874, he's in fact one of America's uh, most intrepid and worshipful explorers of the West. For decades, he tramped up and down uh, through the western extremities of North America, from California Sierras all the way up to Alaska. He wrote stories, he observed, he reported, he praised, and he experienced. In fact, he modeled a childlike delight when it came to the outdoors and a mature reverence. On one occasion, Muir visited a friend who had a cabin snug in the Yuba River Valley in the Sahara Mountains, a place where he could venture out into the wilderness for a time and then return for a comforting cup of tea. One December day, a wicked storm came off the Pacific, one of those storms that bent trees as if they were blades of grass. And it was for these kinds of storms that this cabin was built, cozy protection from these kinds of harsh elements. And I imagine Muir and his host, all wrapped up in sheepskins, safe and secure in this tightly cocked cabin, a fire blazing, but this is not how Muir often responded. For Muir, instead of retreating into the coziness of his cabin, pulling the door shut, throwing another log on the fire, he, in fact, strode out of the cabin into the storm. 
climbing a high ridge, picked a giant fir tree as the best perch for experiencing the color and the sound and the scent and the motion. And in fact, he put on his spurs and scrambled his way to the top and rode out the storm, lashed back by the wind, holding on for dear life, relishing the weather, taking it all in. Can you believe it? Eugene Peterson says, and I agree, that this is one of his favorite icons for what it means to follow Jesus. And I would agree. Rather than becoming a mere spectator to life, preferring creature comforts, Jesus invites us to choose a pathway where we experience creator confrontations. When the disciples took Jesus up on his invitation to follow him, they, in fact, chose to leave their comfort zones and to climb a tree. And the same goes for you and I. Because choosing to climb a tree, to leave the safe, comfortable, cozy cabin of our lives and choose to climb a tree opens us up to experience all kinds of crater confrontations because we know when those things happen, those divine collisions our lives are changed. In fact, we grow the best, don't we, when we're out of our comfort zone? And we see this example all throughout Scripture. Moses, Abraham, Jacob, Ruth, Esther. I I, I encourage you, if you're going to read the Bible this year, read the Bible with a fresh new lens and begin to look for creator confrontations. You might see Scripture maybe a little bit different. So many creator confrontations all through Scripture. And this situation is no different. As they walk through this story, I want you to look for, and we're going to look for and identify some creator confrontations for ourselves. Jesus takes his disciples tree climbing, so to speak. He takes them out of safe Galilee, away from what they would see as comfortable, their people, their fishing boats, their homes, their families, to this place called Caesarea Philippi. Well, we don't know much about Caesarea Philippi if you're just reading the text that Chris read for us. So what was Caesarea Philippi known for? Well, it was a pagan city. It was a pagan place. In fact, what went on there was the worship of Pan. And in fact, they called the place the Gates of of hell. There was this deep, deep quarry that they told me when I was there 15 years ago that there was no bottom. Black as black could be. In fact, what they did there in pagan worship, they would sacrifice people in that, in those waters. All kinds of crazy things happened in Caesarea Philippi. And this is where Jesus takes these young disciples many of whom were teenagers and young 20-somethings. Could you imagine what these good Jewish boys would have felt like that day? I wonder how unsettled they would have been in that place, up on the hill overlooking the gates of hell. And who knows what else they would have witnessed that day when Jesus launched into his teaching moment. And in fact, Jesus created a teaching moment. He knew all along, I'm going to take them to Caesarea Philippi. And this is going to prepare an opportunity and create an opportunity for them to be teachable. Jesus essentially says to them, in light of this, in light of all that you see going on here right now, in light of all that you've seen so far in our journey together, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? It's a timely question. In fact, this is the first creator confrontation. God creating teachable moments in our lives. Where he often unsettles us. He takes us out of our comfort zone. He throws us curveballs. Or in fact, life throws us enough curveballs for us to manage. But Jesus somehow in his grace allows those things to be teachable moments. It's in these teachable moments we become open to new ways 
of seeing God. What sort of teachable moments do you find yourself in these days? Maybe it feels like you're on the top of this tree in the middle of a storm getting storm-tossed. Life often is like that, isn't it? See, Jesus is far from safe, isn't he? I think our Western view of Jesus is way too sanitized and, and domesticated. Walter Brueggemann, I like his statement. We live our lives before the wild, dangerous, unfettered, and free character of the living God. Reminds me of C.S. Lewis in the Narnia series. And children are about to meet Aslan the lion. And Lucy says, is he safe? I should feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He is the king, I tell you. You've heard the quote before, we've, we're, we've created, we're created in God's image and we kindly return the favor. Have you heard that before? We love to fashion a God in our own image, don't we? And if it was up to me, I think I would create and manufacture a God much more predictable, uh, much more easy and nice, a lot nicer than a lion, if it was up to me. My choice, I think, if I were to create and manufacture some idea of God, I think it would be more like a golden retriever. <laughs> Always greet me with a smile and a kiss. Always comforting, warm, loyal, and fun. Hey? But think about it. Left to her own devices, the God of her own choosing, her own doing, would be both predictable and impotent. Powerless to do anything significant in our lives and in the world. I love how C.S. Lewis describes Aslan, far from safe, but good, a good king. And we all need a good king, don't we? Jesus was far from predictable. Calling these Jewish boys to follow him would have been a costly decision, a daily walk that would have been constantly challenging their precepts and their assumptions of who God is. So Jesus takes the disciples tree climbing because he knew that it's in these uncomfortable situations that we grow the best. And isn't this often how God works in our own lives? It's often when we're unsettled and challenged, a major curveball is thrown at us and then Jesus asks us in those moments, so who do you say I am now? Who do you say I am now? In light of this, who do you say I am? It's easy to quote God's promises when things are going well and when we're warm and safe in the cabin. But ask me that same question when, when I'm at the tip of the tree getting stor storm whipped. You might get a different answer. But you'll get an honest answer. And isn't that the gift? Because we need to get to the honest answer, don't we? Who do you really say I am? And for Jesus to uncover and expose the honest answer, we often have to get storm whipped. We have to be on top of a tree in the middle of a storm for that real answer to emerge. And when that emerges, we can bring it before the Lord and we can invite Jesus into it. And now it can be transformed. Now we can be transformed. So he asks them, who do people say I am? And some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, and some say one of the prophets. And then Jesus gets personal, and he says, so who do you say I am? Do you agree with everything else that you're hearing? Do you, hear, do you agree with what you're hearing on the podcasts and the, the TV interviews and the music? Do you agree with all of that, or do you, what have you come up with? Who do you say I am? It's really tempting to adjust our view of Jesus in the middle of the storm, isn't it? When we're getting storm-tossed, all sorts of lies can emerge. Is Jesus really faithful? Is he really good? Does he really care? Is he, is he really with me? We're all 
all tempted at some point in our journey to dummy down our view of Jesus to fit our experience. But it takes a storm to reveal what's truly there. If your faith is being tested in this season of your life, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a gift. God is at work. He wants to heal. He wants to expose, not to condemn, but to heal, to restore. As a freshman in Bible college, one of my favorite professors was Ken Schmoon. Before each class, he would give a five-minute devotional. And this one particular morning was really profound. He said this, you know, many of you as freshmen come to school eager to follow Jesus and become equipped to be world changers. But many of you have really just begun your walk with God. You, you, you would describe your relationship with God as vibrant and real, but really, to be honest, you know him because he's quite predictable. He's safe. You pray and he answers. You give money in the tithe offering and God blesses you and it works for you. Then he said this, many of you will go through what's called a dark night of the soul where it will feel like God has turned the lights out where it feels like God isn't present, that your prayers are not being answered, and when it feels like everything is going wrong, and when and if you make it through that dark tunnel, God will have changed for you. He will no longer just be your friend. He will now be your God. He will be your king, your good king. So the first creator confrontation is teachable moments. The second confrontation, God confrontation, is God speaking words of life. Stuff emerges, good and bad, and then we hear the voice of Christ in that situation. Amidst the discomfort, Jesus asks this question. And Peter responds, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I wonder if that surprised Peter. What just kind of bubbled out of him? Oh, where did that come from? Right? The passion, the, the strength. Often what emerges out of the storm uh, is as real as it gets. And the blessing that this opened Peter up to is incredible. Jesus speaks into him and says, Oh, you are blessed, Simon. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from anybody else. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Incredible calling and new identity that Jesus speaks into Peter is a result of what kind of emerged out of him. Talk about words that shape Peter for the rest of his days. As we take our stand amidst the storm, experiencing our own crater confrontations, we open our hearts to see and hear God in new ways. We speak and then that we we catch a glimpse of God's delight and His affirmation in our lives and our view of God expands and matures and we become the people that we're designed to be little by little, all by God's grace. Huge spiritual formation comes out of these moments. And that's not all this field trip, this facing the storm accomplishes. The third creator confrontation is God opens us up to a deeper humility. Humility is defined as confidence properly placed. James says, uh, God opposes the proud but gives more grace to the humble. If I had $5 in this pocket and $100 in this pocket, which one would you choose? The one with more, I would assume, right? More grace. He gives more grace to the humble. Humility is absolutely critical, isn't it? Humility is defined as confidence properly placed, not in ourselves, but in God. And for us to get to that place, usually we need to be humbled. Not humiliated, but humbled. It's a gift. Jesus said, 
just said what was going to happen in Peter's life, that not even the gates of hell would hinder it. And then he begins to talk about suffering. And, and this isn't going to be a cakewalk. And this is now rattling the disciples. He proceeds to tell them that he would suffer many things and that he would be killed. And it doesn't fit Peter's view of how this is supposed to go. His nice, neat, tidy life and how he per, uh, perceived the Messiah to live and to conquer the Romans, this, this was not computing. Try to imagine what the disciples would have felt. It would have, it would have been like the captain of a hockey team saying, we're purposely going to let the opposition score 10 goals in the first period. <laughs> Do you think you'd get pushback? <laughs> I think so. It's like Charlie Brown once said, winning ain't everything, but losing ain't anything. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder he got pushback. Peter takes him aside and begins to reprimand him for, for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. And Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Whoa. Wow. Jesus just gave Peter the rock. And now he rebukes him for being Satan's mouthpiece, trying to take him away from suffering, away from the cross. Jesus would have picked this up immediately and he would have said to himself, ooh, this temptation is familiar. I've been here before. In the wilderness, just after I was baptized, Satan came to me with this similar temptation. I could avoid the, the cross. I could avoid suffering and just be king. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew. He refused to take any sinful shortcut to the kingdom. I wonder how discerning we are in those moments in our lives when along comes a lie. Do we pick it up that quick? I know for me, oftentimes, I can be guilty of taking the sinful shortcut to the kingdom. Oh, I don't need to suffer. I find myself on the tree at the tip, in the storm, getting storm-tossed, and I go, you know what, I think I could just climb down off this tree. I don't need this suffering. I can, there's, there must be a shortcut. There must be a better way, right? You ever been there? Jesus picks it up and he rebukes it. Nips it in the bud immediately. What was Peter trying to do? He was trying to control Jesus. Trying to control the outcome. Peter had in mind how this was supposed to go and suffering and death wasn't part of it. I want you to, to think about this for a moment. You know, our need to control, I think, stems from the same thing as a religious mindset. Religion is humankind creating ways to reach God, manipulate God. If I pray the eight paths, then I will get God's blessing. If I come to church and I rub the genie lamp just the right way, I'm going to get my three wishes, right? Right? We can actually come before God, and all kinds of faith systems do this, and they, it makes you feel like you're in control. If I do this, I get this, right? I've seen that same pattern in my own, in my own Christian journey. And Jesus has had to call me on it. I think this is where Peter's religiosity was cropping up. And Eugene Peterson gives a great definition of religion, which I appreciate. It comes from the, from the Latin, religiere. It means to bind up or tie up again. And it's a beautiful picture. Eugene Peterson says, Keeping it all together or getting it all together, strolling through the forest, enjoying the country, whistling in self-satisfaction, carrying my well-bundled life in a nice, neat package. Memories and morals all in their right place. Goals and diversions. Prayers and devotion all sorted and tied together. Oh, it's nice. And then life happens. The storm comes. Fierce and sudden and gusts. Tears my packaged life from my arms. And scatters it, its items every which way all over the forest floor. I wonder how many of you have experienced that 
very thing. What do we do then? What are we tempted to do? I think for most of us, we're tempted to run helter-skelter through the trees, crawl through the bush, frantically try to recover all the pieces of our lives, searching for and retrieving and putting back together again, rebinding whatever I can salvage of my life and then hiding out in the warm, cozy cabin until the storm blows over. Don't we do that? I think left to your own devices, we all respond that way. And this is what I suspect Peter is trying to do. What Jesus is trying to expose. Peter is saying, no, Jesus, this isn't how it's supposed to go. And Jesus is saying, no, Peter, this is exactly the way it needs to go. And it won't make sense to you. Because my economy is different. You need to trust me with this. We want to keep our faith and life in a nice, neat package, memories, morals, spiritual practices, nicely sorted, but then life happens. A curveball is thrown our way. We do this with God. I think we surely do this in our human relationships. If we get angry and impatient with God, then likely we get angry and impatient with people when they don't fit when they don't act or live the way we think that they should. It's humbling. At any moment, we can actually get in the way of what God desires to do in someone's life and get our agenda mixed up with God's. We mean well, but oftentimes it uh, it does more harm than good. What a wake-up call this must have been for Peter and the disciples. Peter just received this incredible blessing, words of life, but now he's exposed But what a gift. Peter grew in huge self-awareness this day. He was now aware of what he's capable of. And God used it to create a deeper dependence on him. Not on himself, but on him. It's like Jesus is saying to him, Peter, I'm not going to use you in this way because you're somehow great. But because you're broken, because you're weak. Because you're dependent on me. Paul's words, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. I like Leonard Cohen's song, Anthem. Ring the bells that can still ring. Forget the perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. I think Switchfoot probably took that lyric. How they say it is, the wound is where the light shines through. The wound is where the light finds you. Have you experienced Jesus that way? When he exposes the darkness, the ugliness of our hearts, and it's in that moment that we just bring that before the Lord and say, oh, yeah, that's who I am. And we experience the love of God when we're at our worst. Yeah, the wound is where the light finds us. And that's Peter's experience, and that's so often our experience. That's the third creator confrontation, and then that which leads us to the fourth, and I think it's it's the crescendo. It's where God invites us to approach life in a whole new way. Not because he's a killjoy, but because he knows this is the best way to do life. He says and invites the disciples to take up their cross. To not just climb the Douglas fir tree, but to climb their tree. To take up their cross. The tree. I think to die to ourselves is the ultimate letting go. Jesus said to the disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross and follow me. And if you try to hang on to your life, nice, packaged, neat life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. What what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? If anything worth, is anything worth more than your soul? This is the climax. This is the crescendo in the story. And it's often the crescendo in our own lives, isn't it? Where we finally come to terms with the stuff we're hanging on to and we say, I let go. The picture I had is John Muir cruciform on the tip of that Douglas fruit tree. 
relying on his strap and to just be a cruciform and just say, I give up. I know you've got me. Taking up our cross, I think, is the ultimate form of letting go. The picture I have is this. The storm has happened and we're amidst the storm. Life has let us down. We've experienced the crisis of limitation, whatever that might look like, look like for you, in some way, shape, or form. And now we're running helter-skelter through the trees, crawling through the bush, frantically trying to recover the, the pieces of our lives, searching for and retrieving and trying to put things back together again the way that they were, trying to make sense of the injustice and the mess. And Jesus comes along and he says... Just let it go. Just let it go. Let your questions, your turmoil, just let it go. Drop what you're holding on to and come to me. Embracing the cross, denying ourselves is the ultimate form of trust, isn't it? Which can lead us to a deeper place of intimacy with Jesus where we take the posture of the Apostle John in the Passover meal. What was his posture? His head was on Jesus' chest, a place of intimacy. That's the ultimate confrontation, to know Christ, to know his intimacy in those moments when we're, it feels like life is shattered, but we are coming to know him. What does tree climbing look like for you? Where have you experienced greater confrontations? Has it led to a deeper letting go? Where you're up the tree getting storm-tossed and you finally let it go? Kenda and I have had several tree climbing moments over the years of our marriage. Probably one of the most significant greater confrontations, climbing that tree, getting storm-tossed is been our choice to adopt nine years ago, and sometimes, even today, it still feels like we're getting storm-tossed. There's lots of creator confrontations in that experience. Like I shared last week, leaving ministry of 28 years and diving into being a bus driver, taking my air brakes in class two, and to be clear, this has been one of the most com comfortable things I could have done. This has felt very much like stepping out of the warm, safe cabin of what I know of, of professional vocational ministry and, and doing something that is completely foreign. But I've begun to experience Jesus in all kinds of new ways. These describe just a couple of my trees. But what does it look like for you? What are yours? likely pretty painful. Our story has a lot of pain. Climbing that tree isn't necessarily fun. It's not for adventure seekers. It's not like, oh yeah, man, let's get it. Let's go for it. When Jesus invites you to climb the tree and you find yourself storm-tossed and it's terrifying. It can shake you to the core. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's why it's so tempting to try to fix and mend our lives to put it back together the way we had it before. But Jesus is saying, it's, it's not that. It's me. It's an invitation to know me. That's the posture. That's the ultimate creator confrontation that I want to leave you with. And, um, and as we come to the communion table. I want to invite the communion helpers to the table. This is what I want you to think about as you come and receive the bread and the cup. Ponder the creator confrontations where you may find yourself in these days and understand that Jesus climbed the tree. He left the safe confines of heaven and he came to earth, knowing full well he would experience the full brunt of all sinful humanity could throw at him. But he did it because his Christ's love 
could not constrain him. So think about Christ as you come to the table. Take your cup and your cracker and bring it back. And let's just ponder that as we wait. And if you, um, if you are new here and you have not yet put your trust in Jesus, uh, climbing this tree is a foreign idea to you. Maybe you're not ready and that's okay. It's just not the time. But if this morning you are sitting there going, oh man, this resonates. I, I want to put my trust in Christ. Then this table is for you. The invitation is to come for the first time and receive Christ's body and blood for you and receive it by faith. But if you do that, I encourage you to tell somebody. Don't leave here and not tell a friend or one of the leadership so that we can walk with you in that journey. Can we do that? Michael Card's words, come to the table, which he has prepared for you, the bread of forgiveness and the wine of release. Let's come. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about the Passover meal and Jesus sitting there with his disciples. And he's just broken the bread and he has the cup. And you're sitting there. You're among the disciples. And he's looking at you. This is love emanating from him for you. No condemnation. And he's saying to us, come, let's take, let's eat the bread of forgiveness. Let's eat together. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood. This represents this new covenant, new relationship. Let's celebrate Jesus and his shed blood on our behalf. Heavenly Father, that is our, that is our prayer. We sing it to the best of our ability with all that we can and all that we've got. And we confess, even as we sing it, there's likely still areas of our life that we're not ready to release to you, but we thank you even for those things that you are patient and kind and gracious, that you continue to pursue us. Thank you for your great love and your patience with us, Lord. Continue to pour out more grace on us. We need it. We need it. We need it for these days. As we're storm-tossed, it's hard, Lord. We want to retreat to that safe, cozy cabin. So, Lord, give us the grace to remain and to stand firm in our, in our commitment and our love for you. And uh, we trust, Lord, that we will experience a deeper intimacy with you. Help us to just keep running back to you. We thank you for your word. Continue to speak to us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.